Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. The Christmas story continues. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I have called my son out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the word spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted because they were no more. After King Herod died, an angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled today. He will be called a Nazarene. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say, Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat>
Well, we're celebrating a special Sunday today. Do you know what it is? No. What, do you remember what last Sunday was? Sunday? <laughs> Cold. Cold. <laughs> we remember we all got stars last week. If you didn't get a star word last week, there's still a basket out by the door in the community room. What? Oh no, <laughs> you already failed what you said. Well, that's why it's going to guide you all year long. It was that funny word, right? Epiphany. Oh yeah. When the kings found baby Jesus, because they followed the stars, so everybody got a star that we're going to follow all year long. If you didn't get one, go pick one out. We prayed over them so everybody could get the right one for them. And today is another special Sunday. What's tomorrow? Monday. Monday. Martin Luther King Day! So this is Martin Luther King Sunday, the day before. And so we're celebrating Martin Luther King. Because you have off tomorrow, right? That's pretty nice, huh? Say thanks to Martin Luther King for that. But we have a lot to say thank you to Martin Luther King for. And it's a special Sunday in our church. And so I wore a very special stole. Did you know this is what that's called, a stole? And it represents that I'm a pastor, basically. That I went and took a whole bunch of classes and studied hard and answered lots of questions. And when the bishop puts it on you, he goes like this. Because you have to feel the weight of your calling. That you've answered the call to follow God. So this is a very special stall. Can you guys see what's on it? Kids. Kids. People. Children. And their skin's all different colors. And what kinds of stuff are they wearing? Can you see that? All different clothes. Some have headbands. Some have hats. Dresses. Good job. Say that again. They're all wearing, yeah, their different clothes for either from their religions or their countries. And I think this, this is one of my favorites because it's so cool and it shows us this is who the church is. This is what we call the body of Christ. It's every, ch every child, every color, from every country. And Jesus came for all of us. And we sang that very special song, right? Did you hear the words that we were singing? Do you know what, what language? It sounded like French. It wasn't French. It's not Spanish. And your dad is there right now. No, not Italian. <laughs> it was Hebrew. So where do they speak Hebrew? <laughs> not Italy. Israel. Israel. That's where they speak Hebrew. And guess who was from Israel? <laughs> yeah, your dad's there right now. <coughs> who else, Who's from Israel? You know? It's the answer that you can give to any question during yeah. children's time. Jesus! Jesus was from Israel. And he, he knew some Hebrew. They also spoke Aramaic, but he, and Greek, so he knew a bunch of languages. Lucky him. But so we sang that special song, and I'm wearing this special stole, and it's a special Sunday, so what, what, what is it that we're celebrating? Martin Luther King, but what is so special about him? We got an answer from the back. What's so special? Yes, he was helping to make everything equal for everyone. No matter what you look like, no matter where you're from. And he worked really hard on it. And Jesus was doing the same kind of stuff. And so, I call Martin Luther King a prophet. We heard in the Bible story we read that everything that happened to Jesus was fulfilling what the prophet said. 
because they were people that spoke God's word, and all of the, what they talked about seemed to be coming true for Jesus and his life. What do you got, Chloe? Um, I don't know Yeah, he had lots of friends of all different colors. Right, when he was little, his friend said that his dad wouldn't let them play together. Yeah. And that, that started him thinking that this stuff isn't right. And so he was trying to make things better. And he was a pastor himself, too. He wore stoles like this sometimes. And he was doing the work that Jesus came and told us that we needed to do. So it's a special Sunday where we remember him and try to keep doing what he told us. We try to fulfill and make happen the words that he spoke, because we know that he was a man of God speaking God's words to us. So we're going to pray today a special prayer that Martin Luther King Jr. wrote. And it's a video, so I'm going to ask all you guys who can read to read it with me. Okay? That's going to be our prayer before we go to Sunday school. Are you ready to pray with me? Read the words on the screens. And ask you now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray together. <coughs> oh God. Make your truth known to us this day and forever. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So each week now since Christmas, we've been reading the continuation of the Christmas story in chronological order as we find it in scripture. Christmas Eve, of course, we heard the familiar story, 
that we all love. The angels announcing Jesus' birth to the shepherds, telling them not to be afraid that this means there will be peace on earth. And then just two weeks ago, the Sunday after Christmas, we heard the story from Luke when Jesus' parents took him to the temple to be blessed. And while they were there, two different people came up to them saying, God has shown me that your son is the Messiah. The old man, Simeon, said, I can die happy now because my eyes have seen our salvation. And last week, we were back to Matthew's Gospel when the wise scholars walked across the world for months just to find Jesus because a star had appeared in their sky, signaling the birth of a great king. And these foreigners brought with them extravagant gifts for him, and they worshipped him. These are some great stories we find if we keep reading past the manger. But today, we hear the end of the story of these events that surrounded Jesus' birth. And we find it's an odd twist for such a happy, miraculous story. It ends kind of badly. I mean, just imagine if you were reading this for the very first time. It's hard for us to do. But imagine you're reading through the birth of Christ and hearing all these wonderful, miraculous signs, angels, and a star, and a manger, and they're singing and rejoicing, and then you turn the page and all the babies in Bethlehem are being massacred? What the heck just happened, God? You promised peace. This was supposed to change everything. For obvious reasons, this part of the Christmas story is not usually shared. But I found if it happens in the Bible, somebody painted a picture of it. In fact, there are many depictions of the massacre of the innocents, as it's called. And I recently came across an article claiming that this image painted by Leon Cognier in 1824. The author of the article claims this image is the best Christmas painting of all time. Now I'll tell you, when I look at this picture, I can feel my own horror. Because that is just how I would grasp my little boy under two years old if I was in that mother's shoes. But the author of this article is Mike Frost, and he says, at Christmas we celebrate our belief that the king of the universe has come into the world to wage peace and justice, to bring love and kindness to all. But we forget that the birth of Christ also released a malignant force the unbridled power of empire, the jealous strength of a threatened monarch, doled out upon the most vulnerable of all people. So he says, at Christmas, by all means, remember the angel and the shepherds and the magi and the little boy child Jesus in his manger. But also remember this mother and her child on the streets of Bethlehem. And remember that the coming of the Christ was to set in motion a revolution of love and justice that would eventually sweep away all tyrants and free all victims and end all wars. So, the greatest Christmas painting of all time. This massacre of the innocents as a result of Jesus' birth seems so abrupt and awful. And yet, Matthew tells us it fulfilled the word of the prophets. 
He even quotes Jeremiah, proving that this kind of backlash was foretold. All of it, they're needing to flee to Egypt, they're returning, but going to Nazareth. It all had been prophesied hundreds of years earlier, which for those reading Matthew's Gospel shortly after he wrote it, that was proof for them. That's why he was so clear about repeating that line over and over. It fulfilled the word of the prophet. This baby, this person, is the long-awaited Messiah. The promised one who will also fulfill the word of the prophet Isaiah. Who will bring good news to the poor. Bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim release for the captives. Comfort all who mourn. Give them a crown in place of ashes. So, for Matthew's audience, maybe it was easier to swallow this massacre of innocents if it meant the Messiah would be coming to fix everything. But for us today, I almost think it's harder to hear this story because we know everything isn't fixed yet. Still today, children are murdered. Families forced to flee. Mothers mourn. But not because Christ has failed. Let's be clear on that. It's because we have not yet completed the work Christ left us to do. And still today we hear from prophets who speak the word of God to us, but whose words have not yet been fulfilled. As the kids rightly <coughs> identified, they have off tomorrow in honor of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr who, as I said, I consider to be our greatest modern prophet. Because Reverend King called our nation and the world back to the truth of Jesus' message. That Christ came for the freedom and salvation of all people. That good news is for us all. Recently, a movement has begun to finally fulfill the word of our modern prophet, Reverend King. It's called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And it's uniting tens of thousands of people across the country to challenge the evils of systematic racism, poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation, and the nation's distorted morality. On their website, under the fundamental principles, they say, we are rooted in a moral analysis based on our deepest religious and constitutional values that demand justice for all. Moral revival is necessary to save the heart and soul of our democracy. And they add, we will do our work in a nonpartisan way. No elected officials or candidates get the stage or serve on our organizing committee. This is not about left or right, Democrat or Republican. This is about right and wrong. The Poor People's Campaign was started in 1967 by Reverend King. Just a few months before his assassination in December, King announced a plan to bring together poor people from across the country for a new march on Washington to demand better jobs and homes, better education and health care, because for Reverend King, poverty wasn't just another issue. 
Poor people aren't a special interest group. For King, poverty was the primary sin of our society. And in the last year of his life, he spoke often about the unjust economic conditions facing millions worldwide. He called for a new movement to unite people of every race to bring justice for all oppressed by poverty. He saw how the structures of our society keep people impoverished and how, in fact, our economy is built on the backs of the poor, relying on them to stay poor so a few can remain rich. <coughs> Reverend King knew that the load of poverty, in order for it to be lifted, the thinking and behavior of a critical mass of Americans would have to change. And so he said to accomplish this, we would need a new and unsettling force to form in our nation. A new and unsettling force. Not unlike the new and unsettling force of a little boy born in Bethlehem. That was so unsettling to the king. He thought it worth exterminating all children of his age. <coughs> Reverend King, too, was assassinated before he could see the fulfillment of his <coughs> prophecy. But now, Fifty years later, there is a group of faith leaders who have taken up his charge to unite the poor and disenfranchised, to create this new and unsettling force within our country in order to dismantle the systems that hold the poor in poverty and combat the misconceptions about poverty that allow the wealthy to turn a blind eye to their sisters and brothers. Finally, a campaign is forming to continue this work of Reverend King, who of course was doing the work of Christ, bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release for the captives, comforting those who mourn, while revealing the injustice of our society and calling to task those who allow that injustice to breed. So the good news for us today is that this work has already begun. The prophet has spoken the word of God and the people are working to fulfill it. We can sign on and support it we can show up or make a phone call to a representative, write a check with the confidence that we are supporting the moral revival of our great nation. And we ourselves will be a part of fulfilling the word of the prophets. That's exciting good news for me. I hope it is for you too. We don't have to start from scratch. There are other people wanting to make the world more like the kingdom of God. So may we, this week especially, as we remember Reverend King, may we work to see the face of Christ and the faces of the oppressed, the poor, the fearful and fleeing. May we continue the work of Jesus by bringing good news to the poor, by uniting to be a new and unsettling force against the evil that holds us all hostage in the sinful systems which create and continue poverty. And may we continue to remember and live out the great legacy of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., as he will, by his word,
continue to lead us in doing the work of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.